Okay, hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. Today's episode is like a double-edged sword. The title can be received in two ways, you know, and so I can say I would like to speak about living for life as a service from an angle of service and also from an angle of immortality, living for life. And I feel that both ideas have a common denominator. That means really when I look at meaning and when I look at all the different rooms in this life, different moments I've been to, the, mo the common denominator of every existential uh, experience has been the simple presence of attention. That means there is a way energy is being that it can't have an opinion on itself. <coughs> It can cough though. <laughs> Playfulness aside, the attention is your movement. You know, you can say that your attention moves as the body in front of your eyes. But behind your eyes, the attention is evocational. It arises, it comes and goes. That means there is a stillness before meaning. There is a silence before the language, uh, the language arises, you know. When you think about living, I mean, it has been unconscious, it has been an object that didn't even realize it's an object, just energy being expressed. Now energy can consciously be expressed now with the, the evolutionary leap we have made. So you can say people have always been <clears throat> alive, but very few people have been living for a conscious life. There's a word <coughs> in Vedanta. It means uh, the word is samsara, samsara. The moving illusion. And I remember in one talk I was like the only way Sam and Sarah can get out of samsara is if they realize they were never in it. Usually a system, a system especially um, one like Earth where the person is born in, <clears throat> it's very hard and very complex to see outside of the system that's giving you your definition. That means it's like, it's like you're defining yourself based on a language, let's say the English language. Now somebody is trying to tell you think uh, uh, through Japanese, think Jap in a, through a Japanese language which you are unfamiliar with. You know, it, so, so <clears throat> I'm just trying to say that we have a sort of familiarity that is based like the alphabet of our knowing, let's say, the alphabet, uh, not just on a symbolic level, imagery level, it's based on the environment. The human, is, the human being is using familiarity <clears throat> to separate from the unfamiliar, but its familiarity doesn't update. It, its knowledge doesn't update unless it, uh, uh, it, it can forget unless the variables change. Because sometimes I think about it, I think about how a human being has so many different memories from different moments of their life, but what if all of life was one memory? What if it was all one memory and you couldn't see any of your other memories? How strange would life be then? It would be like a picture, you know? So it's like there comes a sacrifice, either immortality uh, and you're a picture on a wall, or you're in a film and you're mortal. So you, you so so this immortality is for um, <clears throat> a snapshot analysis of the meaning of life. You know, it, it's a picture that doesn't want to change. It's a memory that ha uh, uh, considers it has no additional dimensions. 
That means my relationship with memory, you see, it's never 100% me accurate memory as the time the event happened. It's certain patterns or what was experienced about the event. Do you know, that means when I think about out of all the things I've experienced, what I remember, there were, th uh, usually it's where I had to put an effort, where I was involved. Do you see, anything I was involved in, I remember. Anything I wasn't involved in, it, it, f it feels like as if I didn't even care enough for that idea or experience to become memory. So I feel it, it's like the memories are going through a hunter games of an experiential impression. That means the person gets so many different experiences in this life, but why that peculiar memory is remembered. You know, when I think about my youth, it's not like I'm remembering all of my youth, all the days I've lived. I just remember various checkpoints, checkpoints of feeling as if I was an actual experiencer. <clears throat> Something I thought about in regards to memory, which really f astonished me personally, was that I noticed that the memory has to be semi-created from a new memory. So right now, it's like me, rem here, check it out, this is what I'm saying. Right now, if I remember yesterday, now, which memory? Is, 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 is that memory of yesterday a new memory, or is it the same memory? I'm suggesting it's a new memory. I'm suggesting that because there's new dimensions to the self, no memory could ever be like the way you experienced it. This is why I feel time travel, even if we had the technology, would be impossible because we have changed. That means when they say the past is past, it, it, it is not a lie. I feel it's not that the past has passed you by, it's that the past has passed away. Like right now as I'm saying these words, the experience, the texture, the feeling, the way my attention is in this moment, the attention lingers after this moment. But the way I'm animated is not, it, it doesn't stay. Do you know? So I'm saying that based on how you choose to see life, after some point you're like, what am I doing seeing things as just static images in a changing world, in a dynamic world? One of the most incredible questions, <clears throat> the whole question that really led my whole life to come <clears throat> towards this ivory tower, philosophical ivory tower. I can tell you that there was something I felt I didn't know and I felt I couldn't know. And it made me feel a sort of appreciation for the unknown that I had never experienced. You see, usually the experiencer is shaped. That means if somebody asks you, who are you? You have a story, you have a name, you have memories. Do you see? But if the memories, the way the memories were classified was taken away, you know, really you are where, how your energy expresses really. <clears throat> that means I'm, I'm thinking like, are we, ch are we, is the world changing and has there never been a monopoly on meaning? What, what do I mean by that? That means we have one view where it's a pattern that repeats and we have a view where it's endless emerging new patterns. Now the way we're living as human beings, it's as if the pattern repeats, you know? But I feel actually every moment has a novelty factor that can in no way make it identifiable with anything in the past. That means even though I see something this is why it, it, there's a familiarity, but an unfamiliarity as well. <clears throat> that means some, something about it resembles something you've noticed before, but there's still variables about the phenomena that you can say it's new. You know, it's like hearing an instrument you've never heard before. You know, or someone who's seen a violinist and you've never seen a celloist, and then you see a celloist and you're like, yo, that's a totally different sound. You know, so, and it, so it, it, it's a... It's a um, uh,
You know, there was there was something in um, growing up. You know, I noticed, and it was that every person had two stories. They had a story where they were telling themselves, and they had a story which they had accepted. One story was creative. It was it was there. It, 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 you can say it's as if there is a way you see yourself that no one ever sees. You know, it's the real you that has nothing to do with the effect of what you do. You know, there's a there like right now as I'm sitting here, like endless people. You can have a room filled with people, and I will see them, and I will know they will see me. But they, I know, deep down, they don't see me because I don't even see a self deep down. <clears throat> that means when someone says they understand me, I'm like, understand who? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't know. There's something there though. There's something about life that it's not just, you know, like a soldier where they give you an ideology and yay, you're in the battlefield. Just, you know, you just run in there and do whatever. It's, it's like after some point, the soldier has to put down his weapon. The soldier has to take a vacation. And when I say soldier, I'm being metaphoric in the sense that life is a journey and there's, there's chaotic and ordered moments and so you got a soldier on and whatnot. <clears throat> but what I mean is that like in life, really, you're either in the driver's seat or you're in the passenger seat. Or you're clueless. You have no, no idea whose car it is, <laughs> where you are. You're just, you know, you've just went with the flow and you're like, where am I right now? You know, you could... You could <laughs> A quote I wrote for myself was, the only way to live for life, I meant immortality, was to live for life, which is service. And I don't know how many people may agree or even care to see it in the way I do, but what I see is that the, uh, the, the amateur joy of the human being, the joy, let's say the young soul's joy is immortality. You know, sorry, let me say it this way. The human being first feels that emotion is a result. That means this life has an emotional conclusion. If you're just happy, that's it. You know, you, most people, I think their heaven is an emotion. What they think is paradise or what they want, is it's, it's an emotion of a fathomable yet untangible freedom. <clears throat> I would say the algorithm is <clears throat> you are first possessed by your inner realms. I feel all children are. It's very rare. If you see a children not possessed by their inner realms, that means that children is either doesn't realize they're in the world yet. Do you know? When you realize you're in the world, then you see your flaws. A lot of issues with communication I find is when people cannot accept their own vulnerability when they have when they feel they have to be a god in every moment you know that's very hard I don't know how people are doing <laughs> I don't know how these gurus who had god consciousness were doing it you know trying to be god every day like <clears throat> god is even like whoa these guys are <laughs>
an opportunity in a space-time continuum. If the person is in their inner realms, they don't see the outer realms, they don't want to see their outer realms, they don't even care for the outer realms. <clears throat> this was even valid on a yogic level where the yogi, like, it, like it, it didn't matter what happened in front of the eyes of the person, the person no longer had a chaotic or ordered or they didn't have a morality on phenomena anymore. Usually it's the event and what happens in the, in the moment that suggests the morality, whether something was good or bad, but when you separate storification with cause and effect, you're left with a, just an occurrence. So the way the person steps out of their inner realms is either they get tired of their inner realms, <coughs> it becomes too heavy for them, they have to eject somehow, or they build it, they build. They build from their inner realms an analysis of the outer realms trying to appreciate both worlds. So what I mean by this is that it's like the destruction of the idea of a right answer to phenomena. When the phenomena is being processed, where our brains are information, sensory information processors, so if everybody has a different processor, we can't expect to have one truth to reality, you know? It's like, <clears throat> imagine different computers with different processors, you know, on their motherboard. So, so, so it's like, uh, they, different abilities, different ranges of perception. So I feel is that if we try to unify, it doesn't make sense. If we try to remain separate, it doesn't make sense. The only thing that makes sense is to notice that our individual, our inner realms are color. So imagine there's a color palette uh, with 8 billion colors on it. Now, the funny thing is, everybody is their own brush. You're like the paint and the brush. <laughs> your mind is the paint, uh, your physicality is the brush, and nature's painting itself all over. That means it's like seeing birds chirp on, on a tree and then looking at human beings and being like, what if higher life forms look at human beings and they're like, why, are the, why these are birds making noises? I really thought, like, what if extraterrestrial consciousness, you know, they, they saw human beings, but they didn't see as, us as complex as we saw ourselves, you know? Because usually there is contact this is why I feel if we're gonna make contact if there's gonna be extraterrestrial contact on earth it's gonna be from an inferior civilization because higher an advanced civilization would go on trying to contact a more advanced civilization the same way we think of aliens the alien is thinking of its own alien you know <clears throat> poetically speaking, you know, uh, not poetically, just, just looking at the design of just this pattern that can endlessly, you know, it's like the moment the person wondering where did I come from and then wondering where their parents came from and wondering where their ancestors came from and eventually wondering where everything came from and then it becomes a regression back into the unfathomable, you know. I think until 2011, I was born 1991, I think till 2011, I had no care, I had no discrimination of my inner realms. And even in 2011, after a unique experience, the discrimination of the inner realms wasn't known. That means I'm like, okay, so if I'm a physical being in a physical place, it makes sense. Move around and get to know the laws of physics. But if I am a non-physical being, how can I have the same approach as a physical phenomena to the non-physical? You see, so that's why I'm saying the unknown has a major position behind your eyes, but in front of your eyes, because the person is seeking knowing and knowledge and trying to be a certain knower, you know, the unknown is, is made inferior. For me, when, this was the switcheroo. This was the major switcheroo that not only shifted my view on suffering, 
but it also made me able to continue in this plane of existence. There's, there was times where I felt like it, it's, a, it's a broken system. It's a shattered system. That means I, there was a time I, I looked at life and I was like, we're fucking animals. Excuse my language, but that was my honest view. I felt we're animals and what is, what is, what is justice or order when every person sees their own? It has to be something surpassing uh, belief. It has to be something more than just the person can accept from themselves. There has to be something more. There's, there is something missing, you know? There's right now, I'm telling you, there's a, there's a, there's a void in society. And it is the void of collective service. That means even if the, in the human being, we're all trying to act nice, right? Every, every human being, civilized human beings, we're like, we're not fucking animals. We're nice. We're civilized. We have order. We communicate. Yet, our inner realms are as animalistic when it comes to believing what reality is. Because on some level, the person has to, you know, you have to have an acceptance of your workspace to work in it. You know, at the same time, you, if you just accept a limited, imagine your workspace has multiple rooms, but you only accept one room as the whole workspace, then if you just stay in that workspace, you never see something beyond. You know, for me, I, I, like I was blessed in my childhood to travel, you know, even after that. But it, it, there was something about traveling to different places, seeing different ways life is happening, where it's like, you know, let me tell you, um, they take kids to the zoo. How silly. You know, we are in the zoo. And the bars are made of language. We are the animal shackled. I feel like, like, like when the gods shackled the titans in Greek mythology, you know, they chained power. That it, was a, it was a metaphorical representation of uncontrollable power gets punished by the gods. You know, this is why certain sidas, and here's the thing, it's like some people, from a theosophical angle, <clears throat> some people are working with the inner realms, some people are trying to, uh, g like, find the truth in their inner realms, I would say. I not even find the truth. Here's the thing. The mind can personify anything. Think of the young eight-year-old child looking at a teddy bear, you know, before even having a discrimination. And the child's like, this teddy bear is my best friend, hugs the teddy bear, you know. <laughs> you see, the child's mind made an object into its best friend. Now, you think you, you, the, the, the adult's mind can't make a subject into its best friend? You can instantly have endless beings in the other dimension. Like, where is the limit? So for me, the issue was not to deny sensory perception, was to wonder where do I uh, consider its edge? You see? That means when you want to draw something, the paper has to be on a flat surface. There has to be some stability. You got to have some certainty that when the ink of the pen goes on that page, the, paper, the page is not going to move. Imagine you, were, you went to write something and the paper kept dodging the pen. The paper kept just moving down. You know, you're like, what is this? The paper doesn't want to be written on. You know? <laughs> Imagine in the future, some next level scientist makes, like, infuses AI with paper. You know, so the paper is uh, intelligent and the paper, if it doesn't like the writer, it, it'll never let the writer write on that piece of paper, you know. Or a piece of paper where a certain pen only activates it and you can only write with a certain pen. These are technologies I could see happening. But what I'm trying to say is that if there is no trust in the inner realms, it's a waste of time. You're going to scare yourself at most. But if you have cultivated an, a shapeless, and I don't want to say shapeless, but an attributeless trust, like if you feel com comfortable and content with the objective realm, and then you want to wonder about the beyond, that's healthy. But if you want to right away just wonder about the beyond because life is tougher, the person doesn't want to live, you know, that's an issue. Because we are not here to miss out on what we're actually here for. You know, there, there is something where I feel we're a species that hasn't even gotten to the office yet, you know, to start it to work.
We're a species that's still waking up from bed, you know? The whole species, I mean. People are just realizing they're individuals. You know how many human beings don't have uh, freedom? They don't even know they can have freedom. They don't even know if there is more space to their attention. Let me tell you why. Because in my childhood, I was one of those children who f had denied myself my own freedom and no one corrected me because I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't communicate. Nobody knew what was going on behind my eyes. I was this silent um, storehouse of a life, you know? This is me very young, <laughs> you know, like, like a certain phase of my youth, I could say. But in that phase, there was something happening. There is something cool that happens when you, when, when you see on some level, some people say, oh no, bad karma happened. On another level, the Sufi, for example, would be grateful because he's like, the bad karma finished. The karma finished. Many people can notice when their karma starts, but very few people can notice when an, when an inner event has stopped. And usually when an inner event stops, your eyes tear up. Why? Because you found a new way to breathe. You know, I, it, once I laughed, like, so, I don't know how to tell you guys, philosophy is an incredible field of study that is not being taught properly. You know what that means? That means there is sheep in the philosophy department of universities. Philosophy should roar. There will come a time, I hope, where we realize the value of philosophy is that it permits the advancement. Because for me, I'm like, what is this game? You go, to, you go, for, you go to the religious uh, uh, side of the pitch, and you're like, what is this? And they're saying it's it's on it's this sort of abstract narrative, you know, and a narrative that deviates from reality, you know. And then you go see from uh, from the opposite side of the pitch, let's say, from the theist angle, from the atheist angle, you begin to see it's an, it's that it's only this. As if, like, what is this imagination then? Do you know if it's only reality? You know, <laughs> what, is this, what, is this, what is this additional uh, uh, processing of our own mind that we're conscious of in subtler ways? You see, so it's, the picture is not complete when you only take allegiance to one side of the coin of the known and the unknown or the visible and the visible. Some people are saying the truth is invisible. Some people are saying the truth is visible. You know? And they can be endlessly at war. Even if we, we, let's say we had the greatest negotiators, you know, and bring all the religious and secular leaders of the world and con con sit them down and be like, guys, work it out. <laughs> you know, you'd see that an idea can possess hu a human being. An angry person is possessed by their past notion of righteousness. Did you know that? Did you know that, that anger starts from a self-righteous position? But it starts because the self-righteous is only the self-righteousness is only being acknowledged from your, the person's inner realm, they can't see the others. That means I feel violence is being done by the people who cannot see themselves in the shoes of the person they're being violent to. Because if they could see themselves, like imagine we, should, we have a movie where we see one bad guy hurts this good, good civilian, okay? Now imagine a bad guy, even more bad than that guy, comes and beats up the bad guy. And then the guy that was bad to the good guy is like, oh no, you know, there's chaos. Trust me, you can't, the moment, if it, it's like, I'll tell you this, you can attempt crushing things in life. You can attempt crushing uh, objects, you know, subjects, or even people, or even events, or even some rare beings try to crush destiny. 
You know what happens? Because you have accepted the intensity of that expression first, the mind can't see an effect outside of it. So you get locked into a causal narrative, never escaping it. Because you feel the causal narrative, the, the, the cause factor has a power. Like imagine you feeling your past is more important than your future. You know you, will, you, can, you, will, you won't even move. You can paralyze yourself from ambition. Do you know how many people I've, I've spoken to and it's as if, if uh, their notion of their limited ability is because they are setting the limits. Who's telling them the story? That means who is telling you right now the story of how weak or strong you are as a creature? You're going to notice it's you. The most shocking truth that if this life was a simulation, we created it. Righteousness doesn't equal unconditional love. So guys, I'm looking at the chat section. I have, how does it equal unconditional love? The, the righteousness is based on a condition. The, it's a certain way the person's being righteous. Unconditional love is when you're an unconditional being. That's when it doesn't matter if a person, if a bird, if, if, if a leaf, if an object, if an alien, if anything. It, you, you will suddenly have, a, you will give a freedom of existence to nature and that's the only way you're you not not the only way but that's a way where you calm down because joy arises from the witness same as the sorrow you have to witness a passage a change for there to be an emotion because if nothing changed why would the emotion change you know what I mean? That means, let's say right now, the person thinks, I'm perfect, you know? But if things change, even if you assume you're perfect, that perfection is not the same perfection. So there is no such thing as perfection. So what I'm telling you is that language is, uh, is slowing down the world. Language is not accurate. It is the best thing we got so far. So you think uh, it, it could be, maybe, maybe, maybe for, you're looking at the, the, the idea of righteousness and unconditional love from a lens where they're equal. I'm just, I'm trying to look at it from my inner realms. And if you're talking about divine authority, then divine authority is by, na by its nature of being divine righteous. If you want to talk about a righteousness, which is God's, you want to bring God into this? You want to bring God into righteousness? Then it's like, who's right? The big guy. You see? You have no other choice. Because where is the source of the intelligence of the movement of the moment arising? You have pretty much there's, there is two options. Either you consider it as known or unknown. Right now, your energy, you, if somebody asks you, Hey man, are you like uh, a Tai Chi master of your body? Do you know? Of your body's energy? And the person would be like, there's certain moments I control the energy of my body like a Tai Chi master, but there's certain moments I don't. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not, um, you realize there, in certain, there's certain ways there's probabilities of possibility, but there's also probabilities of impossibility. And at the end, it comes down to your will and decision. That means who is creating the rules of your subconscious? Where is your opinion on reality arising from? And I feel the answer to that is it's just attention instantaneous. It's an insta attention of being.
Because how else can we expand knowledge if we don't create new terms, for example? Like how is knowledge, how are books being written? It's, it's the same words, in the, not the same words in the dictionary, but the words being used. It's as if we're all using letters. You know? It's like speaking the same language, yet the way you can speak can be totally different. At best, this is a multidimensional system where we're sandwiched between an outer unknown and an inner unknown, which means we can control knowledge by noticing the unknown. That means there are certain states of mind where I would say there's no thought. I'm not even thinking about life. There's no, there's no analysis, no observation. There needs to be no even observation because there is an instant certainty. You know? Like drinking a cup of water, drinking a glass of water. It's an instant certainty. You don't plan for years. Okay, how am I going to uh, take the cup from the cupboard and pour water for myself? Like, it's, uh, you see what I mean? It's like you don't think about that for years. You don't plan for that. You don't consider a future for it because you instantly know. But things that you don't know, then you can speculate on. So for me, it's, it's about it, like the really what's inspiring, I, I could say, my foot on the gas pedal of my life is the unknown. Because the known I know, I have saw it. I saw it, you know. This is why there's, there's no need to attach to any sort of knowledge or secret knowledge. It makes no sense to even be attached to a method or a secret way or a certain uh, technique or something, you know. I'm telling you, we are not the same users of life. We have all logged in genetically into... an elemental simulation. We have consciously logged into form through language. And you know what it feels like? It feels like if humanity in a sci-fi angle was so advanced and we had a spaceship and we went to a planet and we stepped out of that planet. Uh, so we stepped off our spaceships and got onto that planet to explore it. That's what it feels to me. There, there is something about nature that I look at myself in the mirror and it wasn't, I, like some people look in the mirror and they think, they think about ugliness and beauty. I, I, I looked at the mirror and I'm like, am I being a creature right now? Like what is, you know, <laughs> there, was, there was a point where I was like, there is existential design. The fact that your body heals itself. The, can you imagine if we had to think about our body for it to heal? Literally, we had to go, it's like sit down and for weeks just think about like, you know, a, a, a scratch on our knee, like meditate endlessly for it to heal because we had to instruct the cells to go and actually heal it, imagine. But we don't have to do that. It's in the uh, biological program. It is, in, it is as if there is a field of, our energy is from a field, but our personalities are not uh, don't have per se just an energetic explanation because energy is energy. It doesn't die. It do, it's not born. So that means there is some, something unchanging, but it still is. It, is. it is the word is plus unchanging. The unchanging isness. <laughs> the unchanging being. That is. That is a that, now that is a diamond for the future philosophers to try to uh, every generation try to uh, polish a little bit of the dirt on this mystery because that is at some point you're like where do I p draw the line of the edge of the human being where do I draw the line of the edge of phenomena for example like there's an apple I eat the apple where'd the apple go do you know. The apple now exists as a part of me. Do you know what I mean? So it was as if, like, what happened to meaning? Did I consume meaning and the meaning infused with all my other systems? Could it be just like the stomach, the body has a digestion process? Could the mind have a sort of uh, sensory perception pro digestion process of its own poetically? Do you know?
you see it's just direction of uh, the effort life is an effort it's not necessarily a story it's not explainable it's not hundred percent comprehensible and it's not hundred percent incomprehensible but it but it's just it's just something that there is unknown variables which you gotta grow with the system and if life is not per se about analysis but it's about playing your part in an event which is a rare opportunity in this universal sector I feel reality will be healthier because people use language to uh, like whenever you wanna wherever there's meaning there's language you know there is the idea of something that is attracting to a person attractive to a person and then there's the actual thing that's there that's attractive to the person you know so there is the mystery of life as a concept as a fat something that's that's just a vast unknown you know a, a, a unknown mystery you know just missing part of reality that we can't comprehend and then there's there's a part of reality which is the real thing so I would say I felt after some point it doesn't matter what idea I have on life because it's an event oriented phenomena that means nature has an event like intelligence and I consider uh, uh, literally in my mind the event and the field are the same because it's either particles feeling they're projecting a field or it's a field moving part which is particles are moving in now the idea of God in the sixth century this notion that had developed this monotheistic notion you gotta see it was a counter culture do you know do you know I don't know if many people realize this but if you wanna blame, blame religion you gotta blame what was there before the religion and then you gotta blame what was there before and before that religion because all those played a factor in how the people at that time opened their eyes to the world do you know so you can say that there was a polytheistic thing going on. Uh, a, sorry, pantheistic thing going on, where there were people were worshiping stuff. Can you imagine? Like you go, imagine you go to a grocery store and you see there's a person who's put uh, like a bottle of uh, you know water, like the a bottle of water, and is like worshiping that bottle of water. You know, not per se in a cultural framework, just a person who's worshipping a bottle of water. Their whole life, imagine 70 years of li their life, they never leave that uh, ob objective uh, uh, state. So you can say everything is a state of attention, whether you think it's belief or disbelief or da-da-da-da-da, it's a state of attention. You know, we're not, we're not an image on a wall to dismantle so easily. You know, we're a process as uh, Alfred Whitehead very magnificently suggested, you know, that it's not just atoms in empty space, folks. There's a process. Now, this process is speaking the language of la nature. That means nature, imagine all natural phenomena, is like a symphony orchestra, where there are instruments part of this grand orchestra. That tree growing here, the weather of that part of the world, everything in nature. Imagine it's a symphony being played. Now, you are an instrument, you are a musician in this symphony, a conscious musician, okay? And so you are, you can now choose to go along with the song of nature, which I feel is the ultimate health, uh, even from an ethical standpoint. <clears throat> um, or you can choose to play uh, off tune. So that's the value of the process and an event-based life, that you got to uh, uh, feel the rhythm, regardless of how much you think you're musically talented or not. <laughs> There's an experiential rhythm, do you know? That means I'm sure Beethoven had gotten to a level of insight, you know? Beethoven has a quote that is incredible and many people don't know. His quote is, he says... Uh, don't just practice your art, but force your way into its secrets. For it and knowledge can raise man to the divine.
can raise men to the divine. What Beethoven meant is that this life is an event and there is important, think of between known and unknown variables, there's also important uh, points and unimportant points, you know. So there's some moments in life where you got to engage. That means probably Beethoven saw a bunch of people building a house and it felt like music to him. I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure Beethoven was like on that level where he was trying to make uh, objects probably into symphonies. You know, he was trying to, tr he, music was a language for him, you know. Because when I hear uh, music without vocals, there is atmosphere, you know. It's like it creates the atmosphere. But then the vocals give a narrative to the atmosphere. This is why in some of my early talks, I just loved putting music on it in the background, you know. Because when you have two moving systems in parallel, then there can be links made, or vertical links made between these two horizontal minds that are parallel, you know. There's a quote by Al-Ghazali, who I believe was a Sufi. He says, desires make slaves out of kings, and patience makes kings out of slaves. That's the reality of it. Because in patience, you have more information to work with. Because people think patience is just, you know, just don't run towards your inspiration. But patience means... You are like a slingshot, but from a, your mind. Patience is like a slingshot for the mind where it's just observing, observing, observing. Then once it has an algorithm or some, a, 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 like think of it this way. If the person tries 100% and they fail, that means you can say 100% is not, let's say you do 100%, you achieve 50%. 100% of your effort, let's say you're a student in a classroom, and let's say 100% of your effort is 50%. That means you, you get, you, like you have to, do, so that means you have to do 200%, 200 times the effort to get the same result as someone who, you know, as, as, as the other. Now, if you f accept yourself, that's basic. Instantly accept yourself. There's no other way. <laughs> you know, and every person has accepted themselves. That's how they're being, who they are. You know, so, so acceptance is na natural. So the first thing, once you accept something, you can work with it. Think of a tool. Okay, if you can't, ex if you can't hold the tool in your hand, you shouldn't even think of using it. It's like if you've never, heard, ha uh, never held a sword in your hand, you know, you shouldn't then hold a sword and run into battle. Because the moment somebody has more skill than you, you're instantly defeated. You know? Better find like a shield or go get a spear and go on a tree and kill all the soldiers that way. I don't know. <laughs> That's so silly. Oh my God. But probably someone should have done that, though. No? Someone back in the day in some battlefield... Aziz says, guys, my attention has come to this chat section. So, by the way, questions you, thanks Aziz for abiding by this. Anybody who wants me to answer a question, just put MW in front of it. Then I know that you, it's like you're directing the comment, not just as a general exp expression, but as a, specifically to me. Um, so Aziz says, what's the point of speaking a language that you don't actually use? What's the point of speak what's the point of speaking a language that you don't actually use? If you don't use it, you're gonna forget it. Anything your attention goes away from, it 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 leaves you because you leave it. So anything you care for, you keep alive in your attention. And as the person gets older, the weight they can carry also becomes different. You know, 
I'm, I'm noticing myself throughout the years, even how my life is changing. And it's like, it's very strange. There is an opportunity cost any direction you take. Any. Anything you do, the moment you do it, you can see another way it could have been done. Instantly. So that means there is there is endless ways to do things on this planet. You know? I would say sometimes, if uh, let's, instead of, uh, Aziz, let me just, like, work with your question a bit. You say, what's the point of speaking a language that you don't actually use? Let's change the question to, what's the points of having a skill that you don't actually use? You know? If you have the skill, if you know you have it, if you know you have the strength to lift up something... And you're not lifting up something, you're not working based on your energy level, then it's as if you don't see your own value. Anything you don't use, you didn't see a value in it. You didn't see a utility in it. You know? This is why I'm telling you guys, we're creatures of attention before this whole storified linguistic landscape. I didn't hear, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the thing, guys. Everybody's driving somewhere. It's just how consciously are they driving? Is, is it more joyful for them to experience, for example, their ride, or is the collective ride important? Because you can see, we, the, the extremes can, cannot be maintained by the human mind. That means if we make simplify everything to just a simple love, you know, like I understand love is crucial, but we also have foreign design and intellect, so we can't ignore the design or value all designs the same just because the person has love, you know. That means it's like have, in, have, in, have discrimination. Because it's like the first thing many holy books say this, that you were given uh, a mind to use it. Did you know that? That means you didn't evolve for nothing. You didn't evolve to go and sit just and be a tree your whole life. You, 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 we, have, we, have, we are an opportunity. And honestly, what? The squirrels and birds are going to come and build civilization? Only we can build it. You know? So for me, the failure... It's the, it, let me tell you what happened. I think we are all, everybody is all, everybody's all right. Okay? And I think the situation was that we set up, we, we stepped out of uh, the actual jungle and we, ma we made the concrete jungle. Now, in the concrete jungle, we went towards, I feel what, what's happened is that people feel the driver of the car doesn't care. I think that's the issue. This is why people are not feeling a sort of feeling of service. I'm not even saying like, I'm not talking about like pe telling people to go join the military or something. I'm saying a service to a global advancement. That means I could totally see how different nations are advancing. Nice, good job. You know, different nations, they spend so much money on, you know, um, their military, and if they replace the money they spent for the military for education, it would be just totally different. You know, it's hilarious. I, I, a nation that spends money on education doesn't need to. Hopefully, it doesn't need to spend money on the military because people are educated. Do you know? But if you spend money on, if you, it, here's the thing, it's like anything that's created, someone will come and find a use for I'm telling you that we should think like Diog. We should consider reality like Diogenes. Diogenes, somebody asked them, they're, they're like, where are you from? Diogenes was like, I'm from the Cosmopolites. And the guy was like, speechless. <laughs> the guy's like, I'm, I'm, I'm here thinking I'm from a, you know, remote village, you know. 
uh, you know, uh, remote uh, village or somewhere, you know, that is small in the world. This guy is thinking he's a citizen of the cosmos. He's citizens of a cosmic civilization. A civilization that stopped playing games in the interior. Because the moment we finish our games with the interior, then uh, games of higher communication can occur. It's an authorization based on behavior. Think as if the behavior of the human being. Think as if like we are energy and we have different dimensions of expression. One dimension of expression is physical behavior. One dimension of expression is observation of phenomena. Do you know? Imagine one dimension is just creating sound, just sound, you know, and you can totally just see if, he, if all human beings were in a dark room, all the conversations, imagine that you could hear, hear them as if they were in one big room. Do you know what I mean? These are uh, phenomena, I mean, it depends on every person has a, just like how every person, whole, uh, if, if this was back in the day, Game of Thrones, like, style. <laughs> kind of like realm you know <laughs> if we were in the medieval ages like you you could say not everybody can fight with the same weapon so it would be saying something like not everybody should have the same approach it's weird but at the same time the context can be the same like Diogenes saw that it's a he's a cosmic citizen but he was still being Diogenes you know that means we don't dissolve the citizen uh, by having our attention on the collective first. The citizen is the citizen, the collective is the collective. These are two sides of a coin to every human being's life. Because what is it? Like every, uh, most men on this planet, they become family men. Why? Why do they become family men? Of course, one, one survive reason, uh, evolutionary survival reason, you know, yeah, you know, keep the lineage going, keep, keep human beings continuing. On another level is because they want to be part of a collective event. They want to be part of a collective event. So do you see how there's two urges to life? Sometimes in life you want to be individual. Sometimes you want to be part of a collective and both are okay. But the extremes of remaining in both, like this is why like, um, I don't know, there, there were certain, like, certain yogis who, not yogis, but I would say, like some people were so gentle, they wouldn't even touch a leaf. Like in the yogic tradition, there were some people who were so trying to abide with the oneness of all the vision of the life of the world, that it was as if like they wouldn't want to disturb anything. So they would actually have no free will. They would, their identity is being extracted from how their mind is being space, awareness. So th that could be too much, you know, the, extreme, the extremes of oneness, you know, so we are creatures in a dualistic system, we have the extreme of oneness and the extreme of infinity, you know? Or even if you keep it as a singular, then you have the extremes duality and the void. Because what is living? It's a sequence of events. And in the sequence of events, there is a watcher. And the watcher starts off first person point of view. And if this first person point of view cl closes, it eye closes its eyes, the watcher is still there. But the visual senses, as if like you turned off a setting on your phone. You know, it's as if the visual senses, when you close your eyes for a second, they're not accessible. There's echoes of them, but then you can still see, you can close your eyes and visualize light. How are you doing that? Your eyes are closed. There's no actual light entering your eyes, but how is it you can see an event, an inner event? We are way more unknown than knowledge has declared so far. So what does that mean? That means it's the era of exploration. We were hunter-gatherers of our outer realms, like somebody went and found like, I don't know, 
what did they find? They found like jasmine or something. And they brought it to the tribe. And after years and decades of innovations, people started making jasmine tea. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, the, it, we, hunter, we hunted and gathered external, physical, visible information. Even the word information is information, stuff that's in a form. So we have been re uh, reacting to an external landscape and an endless landscape. Now, I gave a talk on it called Hunter Gathers of the Inner Realms. I don't know, I felt, I felt like I hit the ball in that talk, you know. And the idea was, now imagine it's your inner realms. Sorry, Hunter Gathers of the Inner Realms. And I'm just trying to say, the more conscious we have become, the more we have been able to discriminate. And so if they brought, like we found a time machine, and uh, let's say you won this lottery, but the lottery prize wasn't a million dollars or something. The lottery prize was a time travel. You could bring one ancestor back from time. And it wouldn't change your timeline or something. I don't know, there would be some promise. <laughs> So, so I'm telling you, imagine that ancestor was sitting right beside you and you were looking at an event. You were looking at like some guy doing parkour, some guy breakdancing, you know. You would see, you would see that breakdancer and you'd be like, oh, that's like, you know, a friend of yours, you know. So it's familiar to you. It doesn't shock you. But your ancestor sees that human being doing air tracks, you know. In breakdancing, that, 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 that ancestor would be like, holy shit, I didn't even know human beings could move that way. It would, it would blow their mind. So what does that mean? That means we have more discriminatory power. We have an ability, literally, compared to our ancestors. We can look around and make sense of things. We can classify our senses. But the issue is, we have to realize we made the classes. And the human psychology, the greatest, uh, I would say, finding of psychology was the word the fact that we can study our own minds and that's something I'm sure no one has ever heard a teacher in an educational system say the teachers the student imagine is excited trying to be like exactly what the teacher wants it's like all right teacher you know what should I do you know and the teacher looks at him your assignment is to go and see who you are and write an essay on what you think intelligence is and how you think you're intelligent. And then come and read that essay in front of everybody in the class so everybody in the class sees what you're saying. So you realize that this world requires breaking the veils and sharing. That's the joy. That's the, that's the greater luxuries of life. That's, that's like after you, uh, let's say you're, you're physically content, you know, then the greater desires would be what? echoes longer. So let me tell you why I suddenly realized the value of speech. The value of speech is the eternalization of conception. And what do I mean by this? That means Socrates, his body is gone, but fragments of his mind are accessible. And it's like, imagine Socrates never spoke. Imagine Plato never wrote. You, would, you know how much of actual events in life, the, the wonder of it would go missing? Do you know how um, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, the writer of Lord of the Rings, the author of Lord of the Rings, do you know how, when, like, how that guy uh, came up with the story? He was like 14 under a table in... In, I don't know, in the UK when it was being bombed or something. I heard a story like this. And you could just imagine if, it, if that was the case, like how intense it would be. A 14-year-old kid, you're in literally some strange hell. You know, 
where you're, the flames are coming from top instead of the bottom. And you're hoping your house doesn't get bombed sitting under a table. That means I don't know how smart it is sitting under a table, you know, when the wall can fall, you know. <clears throat> I wouldn't go. Oh, it's so hard to say. But anyways, he was, he was there and it was his inner realms. It was his a 14-year-old's uh, psychological ability to, like, imagine you're 14. You're not a soldier. You don't want to go and kill people on a battlefield. You're just a kid. So as a kid, you, you still want to play, but it's unauthorized in your outer realms. There's war going on. Imagine. So you see that you have nowhere else to go other than to re uh, re rekindle that energy through your inner realms. So I could say Frodo and the hobbits and Gandalf were right there beside him, that kid sitting under that table, hoping the ceiling doesn't fall. Hopefully I'm correct about the story. I, 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 I think it was J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> Let's hope it is. <laughs> but, but it was something like that, and you can totally see the possibility, the implication, you know? I feel we have to share our inner realms. There's literally, you either share your inner realms or you only get to see it and that's it. Ideas come, that's what I realize. Every day is, is, it feels like a new day. So if it feels like a new day, how could there not be an unknown component to it? So we are literally oscillating between the known and the unknown. In the known, we're an object. Uh, in the unknown, we may arise as a subject. I think it's, it's mainly automated beyond personality. That means energy doesn't travel. Energy doesn't incarnate. <laughs> that means I think the way out of the wheel of karma is to study actually energy. That's the center of the wheel that never, never moves. That on an energetic level, how could existence be different? Like, you know, you can't go to someone and be like, yo, I exist more than you and suddenly start laughing at them, you know? You, it's, <laughs> it, it's like you can't compare. Existentially, we're all here. And we have to move. It's like, when else can we build an advanced civilization? Where else? You know, I could understand people trying to be ethical to go to heaven, but it's like <laughs> you can at the same time see like now build the heaven. Do you know? That means it, it's, it's like the opportunity is rare. For eons it has been silence. And recently, this creature has had somehow the spark of language. It was as important as a discovery as fire. Imagine being a caveman, and this is how I feel fire was, this is my view on how I feel fire was first witnessed, you know? Heat was witnessed, of course, but fire, the visuals of fire, you could say that was like, that was like, Evolution is psychological, cycle of fire, just noticing fire. That was a, definitely a psychological evolutionary shift. But anyways, I, I think the situation was, it was uh, there was a lightning strike that hit a branch and the whole tree caught on fire. And then the branch, as the flames kind of burnt the branch, the branch fell, you know. This caveman just picked up the branch and ran towards the others. I think through some miracle, threw it on a bush. The whole bush got on fire. Others got access to the fire. And I don't know, somehow, <laughs> Thor had to do something with this, you know. <laughs> So 
So how can you build an advanced heart without an advanced civilization? Without the idea of an advanced civilization? Why would you need an ad where would you use that advanced heart? That means the idea of an advanced civilization, sorry, I'm just responding to Mr. Great Fool's comment. An advanced civilization means, like, uh, here's my argument, guys, you know, just to be a bit personal with the chat section, this is my argument of why. Why an advanced civilization is the only game to play in existence. Building an advanced civilization is the only game. The only honor left. The only future honor. Some people, their honor is based on who, uh, who, uh, uh, who they were in the past. Some people, their honor is who they have seen themselves to be. Their honor is not just based on who they were. Because it's like the past is tools in a toolbox when it, when it comes to memory. That's what true superheroes sound like, guys, by the way. Not everywhere, but, you know, usually you can see that uh, in this world there's power systems. Weak and strong. Hierarchies, as Jordan Peterson so, so deeply gets into. That means there, it's a system. So the argument for an advanced civilization would be, let's say we heard, or let's say all the arguments, this is my argument, all the arguments, let's say, against an advanced civilization, let's give them all validity. Let's assume they are all true. Now, I'm saying, regardless of the concept or arg argument, the idea for it, it's like wanting to see like a space a space shuttle go beyond the clouds like it's it's a fascination the only global nation that means just to see what it would be like That means the answer to why build an advanced civilization is why not? Because human beings need events also outside, uh, outside of their own mind. If you don't, uh, if you don't unknow... Uh, Okay, um, God bless the world. So, guys, back to the chat section. Mr. Grateful in the chat section says each person is an advanced civilization if they evolve themselves as individuals then the rest comes naturally Yeah, but <clears throat> no it doesn't <laughs> Because if it did it would have come by now You know L Let me tell you what I mean like it has to include see it's this is this is my analysis on a political system but from both angles. See, it's, it's like a system where there is 
the civilization, I'm speaking very generally here, just, just to be able to speak out, but let's say there's a civilization, all, uh, the human civilization, and then there is human members of the civilization. There's members of the human civilization, let's say. Let's say we have alien, aliens, actual, actual aliens immigrating. So, so we have like, an alien could also be a member of the human civilization but they won't be a human member of the human civilization. They would be a member of the human civilization, but they wouldn't be a member, a human member of a, the human civilization, you know? <clears throat> so, where was I going with this? Yeah, so the civilization is a system that uh, there, is, there is the governing power, there is the parent figure, and then there is the child figure. Now, we, this is the case that we are the children of our nation's uh, system, political system, gov governing power, let's say. Governing force to even... Uh, yeah, so, so, so what does that mean? That means there is two angles that are running the system. There is two sides to the coin. You can't just have one side of the coin uh, just thinking it's doing everything and why isn't it happening yet? You know, why isn't the peace here yet? You know, let me tell you why. Because the situation is that the members of civilization and the governing powers have to communicate in a way where they come into a common agreement of what kind of civilization they would like to have. Because the morality of people is left to an arbitrary level if it's only based on their inner realm. So then you have like all the issues of racism, sexism, you know, and whatnot, all the isms, you know, all the discrimination factors, you know. And so I'm telling you, it's like right now, nations are really here and now meditation style, let's go as the moment. But I'm telling you, it has to be a vision that ultimately uh, is ahead of the problems of before. Thinking as if like just how there's problems people had back in the day that we don't have now. And there are problems we have now that nations should be like, he, uh, dear members of this nation, you're not going to have these problems soon. You know, and guess what? You're going to be the ones also to help and solve it. Because you can't wait for the governing power and you can't wait for the members of civilization. It has to be an all both simultaneous participation, you know? So what I'm trying to say is that it's like the same thing in, in that very, I consider to be historic debate between Slavoj uh, Zizek and Jordan Peterson, where Slavoj Zizek was like looking for his words, you know, and the tissue. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he was looking for his words and he looks at Jordan Peterson and he says, Mr. Jordan Peterson, you and your book, and Jordan Peterson is uh, saying all about the individual. So Jordan Peterson taking the individual side and uh, Slavoj Zizek is trying to, in that situation, you know, taking the collective side. So, so in their debate, uh, Slavoj Žižek says to Jordan Peterson, Mr. Peterson, in your book, you have a rule. You say, uh, Jordan Peterson's book is called 12 Rules to Life. You know, I haven't read it, but I hear great things about it. But, but anyways, in his book, he says uh, something that you got to start from cleaning your room, and that's how we change the world, where by cleaning your room, then you clean your nation, then you clean civilization, then you clean the galaxy, then the universe, and da-da-da-da-da. So, so you see, it's not about just cleaning your room. So Slavoj Žižek, in that moment, is like, Mr. Peterson, can you go to some poor bastard in North Korea, uh, as we see it from outside of North Korea? I haven't lived in there, so I can't comment on the thing, but it seems a hostile state. And so it's as if Slavoj Žižek is saying, you, you can't go to someone in North Korea and tell them, uh, clean your room when they don't have food to eat, when the governing system is not efficient. So that means it's like, it's in both angles. A, a citizen that doesn't care for the governing power 100% is a noob. And a governing power that doesn't care for the citizen 100% uh, is also a noob. 
That means both both personalities or uh, um, uh, both agreements, spaces spaces of agreement. Um, they it's as if it's like underneath law is the eyes that saw those laws, you know. And so every person has a. Uh, there is the inner realm. So for me, you look at a kind of uh, let's say a country that's messed up, you know, where the country, um, let's say the country is called nameless, <laughs> and in this country called nameless, there is a authority figure, let's say, that is is not even letting the people have freedom of thought. That means freedom of speech freedom of existence no you can't even have freedom of thought certain things you think about it's like it's wrong you know it's you know even though the argument can be made in the future everything we think about is going to be thought about a hundred times more intense and mess, uh, crazy than we we've thought or said it you know what i mean so what i'm trying to say is uh, and Jordan, so there was a good point that Slavoj Žižek looked at Jordan Peterson and we, there was a valid point. I mean, Jordan Peterson, of course, his point is very crucial because if you can't handle the individual, you can't even maintain the collective, you know? That means that was an idea where back in the day where the notion of communism was, it was like this kind of equality for everybody, but this equality needed a cer certain accompanying human nature to it. So when human beings, their nature uh, wasn't up to par, you know, it, this, it doesn't matter how, how honest of a governing power there was, the people were not honest, Do you know? So as long as there's dishonest people, there's a dishonest government. And because I see there's dishonest people, I'm, I'm never considering the government honest. I'm just looking at the government and being like, are you smart or are you not? That means a smart... A smart, even a governing power, smart governing power would be like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, even if I'm gonna control everything, I'm gonna control the best. So you would invest in the quality of the, these 8 billion tourists on this planet. So the individual, the individual angle is. Yeah, you got to start from yourself, go spend millions on self-improvement. Yeah, you can. It's a path. It's a way up the mountain. Everybody's climbing, though. And you have a choice to see which, which path you want to go. And you can even choose to, like Robert Frost, go the path less traveled by. So, it's... it's, it's, it's um, the solution is a bridge, a bridge of dialogue, of the most intense ideologies, the most complex ideologies, and the most simple ideologies. We allow them to come into a state of dialogue. So you can see that's the only way. You got to go talk to that person. You got to go tell that, that you got to go show that dictator what simple friendship is. Because it's very easy to be cruel if you've never been nice. Or you've never experienced anything nice. This is why you can see a cruel child is like if many ch parents who get angry in front of their children. Be careful. Like when you're a parent, just you got to realize there's eyes. Your children, they're, they're, they have minds. They're every time, they, they, whatever they see, it's their memory. It's being recorded in their memory. You know, so an angry parent, even though the kid could be a toddler playing with toys, that's a mind recording. That's a camera, biological camera recording. The kid might not have a personality, might not have an identity, but years later be this angry kid and not know why. Because the parents couldn't be quiet around the kid. For me, children, there must be a lot of silence, you know. And hopefully, let's say you are, let's say worst case scenario, you're a child who was born beside a house, beside a highway or a train station or something. So what would you do? 
you have no choice your family is there and the sound of the train is going by and years of your life have been going by and you've just heard the sound of the train sound of the train sound of the train right so you have to accept it and the moment you do you can accept new things but certain things in life if we can't accept ourselves think of it this way you can't be a person if you can't accept your personality you, if you can't accept who you are, you can't be a person to yourself. So that's the most uh, instinctual thing. It's literally like uh, the, you put the keys in the engine by accepting the day and uh, living it. And you can, you know, you can declare future. Uh, you can totally plan the future, but it doesn't mean it's the best it doesn't mean that's what the future should be just because you plan it. What the case has been is, and that child needs to understand silence, guys. The sound of silence is the most beautiful sound <laughs> I have ever heard in my life. Silence. The absence of sound. The edge of the witness. So anyways, guys, I mean, I've opened up a lot of ideas, but just to direct it somewhere. We're individuals. Uh, we have lived most of our lives as individuals. Our ancestors lived as individuals. Okay, But as we have been going forward in time, there has emerged more of a collective responsibility. Just like Uncle Ben, you know, before leaving this world, looked at Spider-Man and was like, with great power comes great responsibility. With great evolutionary intelligence comes great responsibility. Now, that responsibility, if you just want to be an individual, you might escape it. So, the, the, the thing is, you, your inner realm and outer realm has to become in sync. So, at best, we can say... The individual has to do an action which is a victory for the individual and simultaneously a victory for the collective. Win-win. Now, more than ever, we don't need people to just, just go in the world and work. We need win-win situations. And the mentality is, even if you're a messed up... Like, this is what I never understood. This is what I never understood about uh, a sort of violence that if violence is expressed and continues that means the more violence there is for the future generations to be uh to have an uh to to respond to you know No, no, guys, I am telling you, I, I have a total different mentality. Don't, don't declare weakness first. There's a quote in Zen that says, um, if you want to climb a mountain, start at the top. If you want to climb a mountain, start at the top. That means if you get to live the day once, if every day happens once, then it's your choice, the quality of vision you want to experience. That's as much as I could say for the individual. Because you can say meditation is cleaning your inner realm, the room in your inner realms. Do you know? That means the individual, it can go multiple ways. The more individual I am, the more multidimensional potential the world has. The more I feel I am the whole moment rather than just the content of it, it makes me feel as if nature is an invisible f event, which is in the visible. That means everything I experience is in my moment of being. 
you know? The climbing, so Robert in the chat section says, when does the climbing start? When you open your eyes in the morning. That's usually when... <laughs> that's when, uh, when I open my eyes in the morning, I sometimes feel like I attempt to calculate the whole day. And then I constantly fix the model. So I could say there's a way of living where you pre-plan the model based on your emotional belief. And then there is a way where you actually let life also make some chess moves. That means it's like, it's like the person not understanding the art, listening, the, the art of listening uh, before the art of speech. You know what's uh, something I think people should practice? I think the human mind, just the human being, it, it, life is so defined based on movement and sound that we have to learn in our own way to appreciate the opposite. And this is better than what the concept of meditation was trying to attain. Because meditation stopped when there was an inseparability between the individual activity and the cosmic activity, as Swami Krishnananda says. That means when there is the microcosm and macrocosm are only appear to you as a linguistic classification, then you don't need to meditate, but then it's like the antenna has been purified. But now you need to consciously receive the signals of life and go forth. And it's strange where as you live life, levels unlock, dimensions to it unlock, and these dimensions often require you having to trust exploring into the unknown. That means if, you're an ex if, you, if you are comfortable exploring, if, explo if, the, if the finding of the exploration is pr a priority over the fear, you won't be afraid. That means I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think truth even should be too much of a concept. At best, truth can be said to be, you are, it's like, a, like wondering what's going on on all levels, not on just a linguistic capable way of communicating. You know, guys, I'm going to... Uh, go into a quote tunnel. Let me see. Does it feel like rain? I, I don't feel it's going to... Let me check the weather, guys. Heat warning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's... Uh, humidity, 36%. Precipitation, zero. But it's, it's cold enough to feel it could rain. Anyways. <laughs> so guys, so that means it's fun. I could keep going with this. Um, I'm going to go into a quote tunnel of Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore um, was a polymath. Who Einstein when to meet. Einstein went to meet this guy. That means Einstein was like, like felt like 
maybe he, he saw another person who saw as far as him. I don't know. <clears throat> Rabindranath Tagore says, Nirvana is not the blowing out of the candle. It is the extinguishing, it, it, it is the extinguishing of the flame because day is come. Rumi, this poet Rumi, just to add something here, he says this kind of enlightenment is like you're, you're like a candle and the candle flame is uh, in a, in, in, imagine in a sunbeam. So imagine a candle flame in a light beam. Like it's as if there is an inseparability of the mind with the soul of the universe in that sense, poetically, with the spirit of the universe. With the way, with the movement of the universe. Because I honestly feel we are an event, we're an oscillating event. That means if I was, to, if Alfred Whitehead was here, I would tell him, hey man, we're not just a process, we're a process that's oscillating. This is why we feel we're multidimensional. Because existentially, the body exists, but you go to sleep and there's a deep gap. And then you suddenly awaken. And so for me, the mind, it's, it feels as if from, it's honestly, phys, phys, um, this physical landscape where life has emerged, it feels honestly like I feel like a character in a video game. But the one who is playing the character is experiencing the, the screen, but is not the screen. So the mind is not stuff, but it watches stuff. It has, uh, it it's identifies with stuff until the Buddha was like, hey, we can identify with emptiness too. And then the mind's like, okay, I'll identify with emptiness as well. <laughs> Rabindranath Tagore says the butterfly counts not months but moments and has time enough. Rabindranath Tagore says age con considers youth ventures. Rabindranath Tagore says, trees are the earth's endless effort to speak to the listening heaven. Wow. Trees are the earth's endless effort to speak to the listening heaven. Wow, you know what that means? That means the same way human beings wanted to get rockets out of, outside of the atmosphere, the branches of the tree were pulled toward the heavens, endlessly trying to reach the heavens. Yeah? Rabindranath Tagore says, Gray hairs are signs of wisdom if you hold your tongue. Speak and they are but hairs. <laughs> As in the young. What an interesting point. Like I, I see like a kind of a thought perpendicular to this.
excuse me, to continue. Faith is the bird that feels the light when the dawn is still dark. Faith is the bird that feels the light when the dawn is still dark. That's pretty much how the vision of hope is coming across. Hope is like uh, another version of this quote, but I think not from him, but from someone else I'd seen. It's like somebody had said the bird before dawn comes. Like the bird feels the, the warmth, feels the heat before it sees the light. <clears throat> and that's kind of like a perfect metaphor for the idea of faith. And it's in the darkest hour when the light, light is seen. And it's in the brightest moment where it starts becoming dim. Rabindranath Tagore says, clouds come floating into my life, no longer to carry rain or usher storm, but to add color to my sunset sky. Every difficulty slurred over will be a ghost to disturb your repose later on. Wow. This is, I'm going to share this in the chat section. That means any difficult thing, any challenge that arises that you don't meet it, it's going to disturb your posi how you are positioned. Guys, I'm going to read a bit more quotes from this quote tunnel. Rabindranath Tagore says, Every child comes with the message that God is not yet discouraged of man. <laughs> wow. That means our hope is being born every day. Literally. Rabindranath Tagore says, do not say it is morning and dismiss it with a name of yesterday. See it for the first time as a newborn child that has no name. Rabindranath Tagore says, a mind all, lo all logic is like a knife all blade. It makes the hand bleed that uses it. A mind all logic is like a knife all blade. You know, the thing is, for me, logic, for me, I never saw... Anything like even from, I saw it like, you see it's science is a method. People who can't discriminate that between that, it becomes uh, inaccessible to them. Because in, in life, I really feel we are like a survivor who has no idea, has no memory of its, uh, you know, uh, of, its, uh, of how it's on this island. And we're just finding whatever tools to survive and get by. That means in the higher classes of civilization, there's freedom and comfort and whatnot. But in certain levels, in certain countries, there's certain things, go, certain lives being lived in every country. Where it's, it's as if they, are, they don't even care about the lo logic. They're just looking for something to eat. Or they are just trying to get by. And the issue is that the capitalistic system is incredible for those if you, if you have a shot. But if you don't have a shot, then it becomes very dismissive. It's as if the weak have to die off, Do you know, in a capitalistic system. You know how many businesses close? You know, it's like those, are, those were businesses who were weak. They couldn't, they couldn't comprehend the market well, you know. So they die, like a, literally in a battlefield, like they, they, those businesses die off, you know? It's war. Business is war. That's why I would tell you the first business book they should teach you is Sun Tzu, The Art of War. <laughs> That's the best business book to read. <laughs> because then you'll understand what it means when the soldier that can defeat his uh, the, the warrior that defeats his opponent without moving 
his uh, weapon without even moving his weapon. What does that mean? That means your initial choice was great in business. So when, when you're looking at the market, because you see many people go and they, of course, get degrees, but then they need the experience component. But the experience comes from where the game is happening. So you got to go back in the day. There was no LinkedIn or there, was, there wasn't even an employee, employee relationship. People were just building stuff and people would move around and travel and they'd be like, hey, man, you need some help? And then they, they, that would be work, the simplest, simplified, reduced version of it. Do you know where it was helping co-create events now through it's not that institu institutionalization is required for the generation of wealth it's pretty much what happens when you have a lot of uh, capital do you know you have to protect it as an as a as a business entity as, a, as an institution right to protect this growing phenomena think of it this way it's as if like your house was a room but as it's getting bigger you're building stronger walls to it or something you know, so it becomes more institutionalized, the bigger, let's see money as energy. The more energy you have, the more you can lift, you know. So, it, 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 in a capital, I don't know how I'm, <laughs> my whole point of this is to show, it's the, the whole, like I, I noticed that it's, I'm taking the talk a different, piloting it somewhere else, but the whole point is, the reason I'm saying this is because, for example, it's not all about logic where in a capitalistic, for example, system, the, the weak are dying off, yet we all want to be equal and happy. It's impossible. It's impossible to have winners and losers and always uh, have, have a nation that is 100% happy. You know, Technically, I would say if nations had personalities, they'd all be depressed. <laughs> they'd all be depressed, you know? And until they suddenly, in the United Nations, they'll be like, hey guys, maybe we should just meditate on the title of this building. It's like, I want all the people, and Mr. Within wants all the people uh, in the United Nations, just go outside of the United Nations, look at the UN, look at the UN logo, look at the title United Nations, look at those words, you know. And th then... You, you should speak in the United Nations. That means if you are not speaking in the context of a United Nation, like you have a bigger picture of where nations are going. Because to me, nations are going to go, um, they're going to become sub-nations of a greater nation, but that greater nation is an endless process. That means we haven't, right now, a lot of things are being automated. Like a lot of labor jobs are going to go away, as, as is suggested by some futurists. You know, that means automation is going to make, make us, um, it, it's going to be like, it's much easier to have robots as employees, pretty much. You know, <laughs> like it even makes more sense. You know, your production becomes 24 7. But, but, but at the same time, I'm saying like, and less, less like products are going to be made way more incredibly, you know. So you can say for, for, for uh, cultures that have freedom, for example, with alcohol or coffee or uh, other chemicals or different plants and whatnot, you know, uh, other than tobacco. So, so the, 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 that's a nation where the, the human uh, psychology is influenced. And you can even say emotion can be seen as a drug. An emotional person at work could ha have the same level of work performance as a person under the impression, under the influence of some intoxication or something, you know, with a person who has chemical interference, you know. So <clears throat> that's the thing where if, if that's going to be automated, eventually I feel govern, govern, governing reality and being a government is going to also be automated. That means robots are going to be able to calculate things that the human personality, regardless of how uh, great it was, just can't calculate. I think the issue is it's not a care. There has never been a collective care. I think one-third of a population, one-third, that means there should be so many le leaders, you know? There should be way more politicians and way more enthusiasm of people wanting to actually care for not just the politics of their nation, but for the advancement of everything that has ever happened so far in history. Because we're the torchbearers. 
We are the torchbearers of the future. And it can't just be all, uh, it's not all rational. We're not living in a completely rational world, you know. So the logic can, can become a, bl a blind belief if it, if it doesn't consider unknown variables and updates. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so I'm telling you that there's a linear way where, where we're looking at stuff in this life and we're telling ourselves a story that we can go from A to B to C to D. And then there's a way that sometimes when the person becomes emotional or whatnot, where suddenly it becomes like, like B, A, C, D, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's just totally, totally different, you know? So that's what I mean. It's um, we have to consider the space of change if we are to even bring it. That means even before bringing any sort of change, we have to have people first wonder why that is that change necessary. Because if they don't have a context, they won't uh, have anything to direct their attention to. And guys, I'm going to share one last quote, and then uh, I'm going to take a quick break, and I'll be back. Rabindranath Tagore says, music fills the infinite between two souls. Rabindranath Tagore says, in art, man reveals himself and not his objects. Rabindranath Tagore says, love does not claim possession but gives freedom. Rabindranath Tagore says, what is art? It is the response of man's creative soul to the call of the real. Tagore says, I have become my own version of an optimist. If I can make it through one door, I'll go through another door, or I'll make a door. Something terrific will come no matter how dark the present. And Tagore says, life is given to us. We earn it by giving it. Wow. So anyways, guys, uh, that's it for the Rabindranath Tagore quote tunnel. Uh, quick intermission, five minute, five minute intermission, and uh, I'll be back, guys. Sorry, everyone. Uh, I had to uh, handle something. It was a issue. <clears throat> but anyways, um, it was a long gap, though. So um, I apologize to the listeners. Pretty much this idea of living for life, <clears throat> I'm, I'm suggesting that it has two dimensions. There is an inner realm. There's an outer realm. The outer realm is you have to study objects and design and form and the sciences. It's very crucial you do this, and especially the medical sciences. And, and there is then, we have the inner realms where it is the wonder. It is like the inner realms is like the hand that's holding the brush. Now, if you feel we are a purely rational creature, you may not be interested in this idea. But if you feel you're a rational creature and there is also irrational moments in life, that means you have a little bit of room to see that life is not just 100% a rational image. It's not like a formula. It's, it's, it's a changing thing. You see? <clears throat> so, when it comes to wondering about 
what am I living for if there is an inner realms? And what am I living for if in front of my eyes I could see like an empty cup, uh, teacup, but in my inner realms I could see exactly see a hot, like a, the image of a, like, you know, a, like hot tea. Do you know what I mean? That means the mind fills the gaps. The mind is the great gap filler. <laughs> <clears throat> and what it means is, I think it's a response to a vacuum. That means I would say the soul is the reaction of image to emptiness. Let me see if I could say that in another way. I'm saying that in, like, in front of your eyes, you see the teacup is empty. In your inner realms, you can see it can be filled. Then you're wondering, then, what is the value of your life if your inner realms, you have access? <clears throat> that means it's like, I, I mean, something we got to speak about. Like, it's just one of those conversations that secular societies need to have, you know? that they wonder about, for example, what is happening to the image and the idea and the value of the human being, you know? And the, think of it this way. You could wear the greatest suit, but if, you're, if you are, uh, um, you know, sitting by a dumpster, it, it is, it, that is an artificial civilization. What I mean by that is the notion of wondering really what you deserve as a living being. <clears throat> In your most honest glance at whatever this world is, what do you deep down feel you deserve? And when I say this, I don't mean in regards to a story where the past instantly tells you, yeah, you deserve this or that. I'm saying... When human beings wondered about what is the meaning of movement, they realized the movement is the meaning. I'm going to share with you guys a story. And it's a story that comes to us from India. And so in this story, there's a hat salesman. And one of those old school, you know, those cylindrical looking hats or whatever. So <clears throat> there's this hat salesman in India. He has a cart and he has all these hats and he's gone to the market. And in his break, he's gone to eat lunch beside some river or something. And so he's, he puts his cart beside this tree. And in India, they have monkeys there. Like I've been there, there's monkeys are like, are like pigeons everywhere. <laughs> Just walking casually across the street, you know. So this man is eating lunch by this river and his cart filled with all these hats is beside this tree. And suddenly, you know, I mean, not suddenly, he eats his lunch, you know, let's say back in the day he would clean his plate or whatever. And then he, <laughs> he takes a nap, wakes up, and he's like, all right, time to go back to work, you know. And he goes to his cart and he sees there is no, no, not, he can't, all the hats are missing. And he's like, there were too many hats for one person to like carry all of them. He's like, what is this? Where, where'd all the hats go on my cart? Then he hears a lot of monkeys in the trees and he sees all the monkeys are standing and they all have hats on their head, you know? Just like how the guy has a hat on his head, all the monkeys have a hat on their head. And all the monkeys are looking at him because this guy's like, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> <clears throat> the monkeys, and the guy says, like he moves his hand, throws a rock, whatever, like the monkeys... Sorry, the guy who shakes his hand, does whatever. You know, the monkeys mimic him. The monkeys make fun of him, you know? Then, the guy gets so 
like hopeless and he doesn't know what to do that he just gets and you know how sometimes when people get angry they just throw their hat on the ground they just want to they can't like smash something so they just throw their hat on the ground you know if you're an angry person definitely wear a hat you know <laughs> release your anger on your hat you know <laughs> so this guy gets this guy gets angry and he's like god damn what is this and he like throws his hat down the moment he throws his hat down all the monkeys who were copying him throw their hats down and all the hats are on the ground and the monkeys are staring and the guy like very slowly picks all the monkeys out of there you know the guy goes home says the story to his son you know his son grows up you know carries on with the family business uh, uh then passes it on to his son you know and so the grandson years later is in a similar situation, still holding the family business, still selling, you know, stuff from this cart, you know, selling the same hats. Now the kid goes to a similar spot, you know, by a tree, similar pattern, eats lunch or whatever, you know, like his grandfather. And then he suddenly comes to seize the cart and the cart of the hats are, and he sees all the hats are missing. And, and the, what do you call it? The monkeys, they're all wearing the hats and he's like, oh man, I remember the story my grandpa told me, you know. So he looks at the monkeys and he sh waves his hands and he sees the monkeys also wave their hands. Okay. So he's like, all right, this is going to work. And he takes his hat and slowly he raises his hat in the air. Okay. And all the monkeys slowly raise their hat in the air and he's like, it's working. Then the guy throws his, the kid throws his hat on the ground. And he's waiting, smiling, waiting for all the monkeys to throw. Then one of the monkeys comes down from the tree, takes the guy's hat, slaps him on the face and says, you think you're the only one who had a grandfather? So that's the moral of the story. The world adapts. <laughs> Honestly, it's like you have the tool. It's like your mind, the DNA of the human being is an instrument. And when you realize nobody knows this instrument, nobody has your eyes. That means nobody, even if you go and tell someone all your problems, nobody can see it like you. They don't, they wouldn't even have to say, like people are different in, in their inner realms, but in the outer realms, they can co-create and have and build a sort of bridge of commonality and whatnot. <clears throat> in the subtitle, I've written speech of the speechless. Speech of the speechless. I think that's a, my, my poetic turn on the language threshold. Beyond language, life moves in ways where it's going to inspire new lives. We have to take our, the story of the world playfully, all stories. This is like a calling to all, everybody on the planet, like relax with the your belief systems and with everything just have have a chill have a, have if when we can see here's the thing we if we want to control an object right if you want to control an object we have to be able to observe that object now i'm saying if the person can't observe they're not a subject then they will be defined by the subject you know what i mean that means if you if you think you are just the image f uh, that your mind in one state of mind created, then you're missing out on how it's again like this massive process where we are just a small candle in a va massive dark hall, dark cosmic hall. I think God, enter, enter, you know, was like, it, it was very similar, the story, you know, you can say the, of the create, creation of the universe to be as if like somebody coming in a dark room and being like, what is this? Let's turn on the light. Bang, you know, realms are produced, realms of sight. 
so anyways guys thanks for tuning in i'm going to share the discord link uh blessings And actually, before I end off, guys, one last quote from Rabindranath Tagore. You can't cross the sea merely by standing and staring at the water. And one last quote from him, everything comes to us that belongs to us if we create the capacity to receive it. <clears throat> and one more quote. <laughs> okay, these quotes are next level, guys. I'm going to read a few more quotes before I end up. Tagore says, <clears throat> don't limit a child to your own learning, for he was born in, an, in another. Tagore says, let us not pray to be sheltered from dangers, but to be fearless when facing them. Everything, oh, I read that. <clears throat> Beauty is truth smile when she beholds her own face in a perfect mirror. Let your life lightly dance on the, uh, on the edges of time, like dew on the tip of a leaf. Tagore says, to be outspoken is easy when you do not wait to speak the complete truth. Now, now the thing is, could he speak the complete truth? I, the truth is beyond language, so I gotta say that. Rabindranath Tagore says, the flower which is single need not envy the thorns that are numerous. And last but not least, Death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because the dawn has come. Yeah. Death is not extinguishing the light. It is only putting out the lamp because the dawn because the dawn has come. Yeah. Okay. Blessings.
Bro, did you say Shirima Mushroom or something? <laughs> yeah, like the fact that if there's actual silence. No, no, no. You know, man, I'm, I'm kind of thinking like, if you give too much freedom to a system, for me, it's like, like, I'm trying to think like the civilization is surfing, you know, and it's not about like, um, an ideological agenda. It's about how do you keep the balance of civilization? No, 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 that's, dude, too easy, bro. Bro, you're just tired, you know what I mean? <laughs>